Hello everyone, it's Benny, and in this video we're going to be talking about a faster way to anti-alias images. Now, in the last video we talked about multi-sample anti-aliasing and super-sample anti-aliasing, and both of those revolve around the same general concept. If I wanted to anti-alias an image like this, for instance, I would render the image at a higher resolution, like this, and then I'd downsample it back to the original resolution, like this. And that gets you a much softer image. And it works. It works very well, in fact. The problem in both cases is performance. Super sample anti-aliasing is ridiculously slow. Multi-sample anti-aliasing is faster, but it's still fairly slow. And it also isn't... it also doesn't anti-alias some of the things that super sample anti-aliasing does, so it's slightly less general, too. So, clearly, we need a new approach. These... even multi-sample anti-aliasing, in general, gives a 25% reduction in overall performance, and that's just... that's not acceptable for just smoothing out edges in most cases. So, how can we do it faster? Well, if we want a faster form of anti-aliasing, we need to make two key observations. The first observation is what is the fundamental problem with multi-sample and super-sample anti-aliasing that's making things so slow? And the fundamental problem there is, regardless of the specific details, at the end of the day, they're both rendering the image at a higher resolution. And no matter how you optimize it, with reducing shadering calculations or whatever else you might optimize, you're still fundamentally going to have all the extra performance overhead that comes with rendering a higher resolution image. So that is the fundamental problem with both of those techniques. So that gives us our first criteria. If we want a faster anti-aliasing technique, we can't be rendering at a higher resolution. It has to be done with whatever, at whatever rendering resolution comes by default or otherwise we're going to run back into the exact same performance issues that multi-sample and super-sample anti-aliasing already have. The second key observation that we need to make is what are we fundamentally trying to achieve with anti-aliasing? And what we're fundamentally trying to achieve is just removing the stair-stepping artifact wherever it may occur in the image. Our eye does not care if it's geometric aliasing, or specular aliasing, or shader-based aliasing, or what have you. All it cares about is, if there's this stair-stepped effect, it should be smoothed out so it looks like an actual edge. Like this. So, those are our two key observations. One. A fast anti-aliasing technique must work basically in image space. It can't depend at all on rendering at higher resolutions or any of that stuff. Secondly, all we care about is just removing the stair-stepping artifact. It doesn't matter how or why it's occurring, it just, if it's there, it needs to be smoothed out, so it looks something like this. And with those two key observations, we can create an anti-aliasing technique called FXAA, for Fast Approximate Anti-Aliasing. And the way this works is just by implementing those two observations. So here's how FXAA works. At every pixel, detect if it's part of a stair-stepped edge. If it is, blur it so it looks a little more like this. And that's the FXAA algorithm. 
it's very, very simple. And as you might have noticed, it's also a little ambiguous. That's why I can't really provide an image of this is what FXAA looks like, because it depends on what edge detection algorithm you're using and what blurring algorithm you're using. And that's also a very key factor to the quality of it. If you choose a good edge detection and blurring algorithm, FXAA can actually look better than multi-sample anti-aliasing in a lot of cases, largely because it handles a lot of cases that multi-sample anti-aliasing doesn't, because multi-sample anti-aliasing doesn't take into account any aliasing that's not geometric aliasing. On the other hand, if you choose a poor edge detection and blurring algorithm, then you can run into some artifacts, like say, the FXAA will miss some edges and they'll still have stair-stepping. Or perhaps it will m detect something that's not actually an edge and then apply blurring there, and that leads into the whole infamous texture blurring issue. So yeah, it's a little ambiguous, and there are better implementations than others. But I'll try to give you a general idea of how you can implement it, some various ways you can do it, and the pros and cons of them. So yeah, that's FXAA. And now let's look at a slightly more detailed version of how this works. So, I'm going to take this triangle right here, and I'm going to walk you through how one possible implementation of FXAA might anti-alias one of the edge pixels. So, since the triangle is a little bit... well, yeah, the pixels are a little bit small, I'm going to zoom in on a section, like this. So, this is the section that I'm going to be working with, and specifically, this part in the dotted square is the part I'm going to be showing you how to FXAA might anti-alias. So we're, FXAA is going through the pixels, and now it's looking at the center pixel. Now, somehow it has to determine if this pixel is part of some edge, some stair-stepped edge or not. And there's a few ways you can do this, like I mentioned earlier. One way is you can look at the depth, because all these pixels in, I guess, a sort of light blue color, all those would ha are a background pixel, so they'd have basically infinite depth, and all these sort of darker blue pixels, sort of almost purpley actually, all of those would have the depth value of the triangle. So, th And of course you can determine, oh there's a difference here, and therefore it must be, you know, an edge. And that's one way you can do it. It's pretty fast, it's pretty easy. However, detecting edges that way can actually miss a few things. Notably, it won't detect, say, specular aliasing, because specular aliasing probably doesn't occur at a depth edge, you know, at a large difference in the depth, so that's not good. So this works, but there's better ways to do it. It works and it's fast. Th that, those are its advantages. But there's an, another way you can do it, of course. Here's a fun fact of the day. Out of all the aspects of color, by far the one the human eye is most sensitive to is the luminosity, or the brightness of the color. If you make a slight change of the luminosity, the human eye is much, much more likely to notice it than, say, a, the same slight change in saturation or something. So, that's another way you can do it. You can detect the brightness of the pixel, and that works with basically everything. It'll work with, say, specular highlights, it'll work with geometry, it'll even work with some poorly filtered textures if you've chosen not to filter textures for some godforsaken reason. So, that's pretty good. It's still not perfect, and sometimes it can actually... it's a little bit more prone to false positives than the depth is, a little, but it works, 
it's fast, and it, in general, this is a pretty good balance between edge detection quality and performance. So that's the one I generally recommend. And of course, there are more advanced edge detection algorithms out there that you can look at, but personally, I would recommend Luminosity if you don't have any specific reason to use something else. So that's what I do. So what you do is for the pixel, you'd look at the luminosity, and I've sort of highlighted it here. The gray pixels represent the luminosity of various pixels. And notice I'm sampling in sort of a cross pattern, an X. That way, this makes it very easy to calculate a vector for blurring direction, because one, there will be a significant difference in luminosity if this is at an edge, so it makes it easy to detect. And two, you notice the dark pixels are on one side and the light pixels are on another, so it makes it easy to determine what direction the edge is in as well. And of course, there again, this is edge detection. There's a lot of ways to do it, so you don't have to do it like this. You can do it other ways. You can sample in, and I guess more of a plus if you want to, and you can probably get something working with that. I'm just, I've generally found this way to work fairly well. So, now that we have a good way to detect edges, all that remains is finding an appropriate blurring algorithm. Some way to look at the surrounding pixels and decide this is a good new pixel color to make the edge look anti-aliased. And this can be a little bit tricky. One way that works pretty well goes a little something like this. You sample, for instance, two pixels on both sides of the edge. So in this case, that would be two pixels in the triangle and two pixels outside the triangle. And that generally works pretty well. So you just take, take those two samples and then you do a weighted average, giving more weight to pixels that are closer to the pixel you want. And again, in general, that works pretty well. And there's only really one danger here, and that's that you accidentally sample too far away and get some pixel of something totally different that has nothing to do with what you're doing. And that can make the anti-aliasing look a little weird. So one way you can sort of help help with this issue, help to make sure you're not sampling in pixels of something something completely different that's not part of your, say, triangle and background, or whatever whatever edge you're anti-aliasing, is to limit the sample range based on luminosity. So for instance, I know that the brightest pixel in this area is this. And the darkest pixel is this. So if I do my full sampling and I get a pixel that's not within this range, then what I can do is I can say, okay, clearly I've gone too far, and just, then just use a smaller sampling range that is within, within, you know, the luminosity range. And in general, that's a pretty effective way of just, just eliminating that effect, making sure you're not sampling in totally unrelated areas. So yeah. And also it makes things look a little nicer, because this way, whatever pixel you anti-alias is going to be in a plausible luminosity range for actual anti-aliasing. So and of, in general, that's just a pretty good way, well, yeah, well, for all those reasons. And that's one way you can do FXAA. Hopefully that gives you an idea of well, yeah, one way it works, and some of the strengths and weaknesses of various ways you can do various things. So, yeah, and that's basically how fast approximate anti-aliasing works. So, here are some of the pros and the cons of using FXAA over other anti-aliasing techniques. Now, the big pro, of course, is that this is fast. Really fast. For one, this operates in image space as a filter. So that means that the cost of anti-aliasing with this is 
totally independent of the cost of rendering the scene or any of that other stuff. And that alone makes this a lot faster than just about any other anti-aliasing technique out there. Beyond that, however, the algorithm itself only depends on edge detection and blurring, which are fairly cheap operations, so yeah, this is pretty fast. But even beyond that, though, it lends itself very well to further optimization. Since it is a post-process filter, you can combine this with some other effect that's already being that's already being used to filter your scene or post-process it in some way. And then you don't even have to pay for the extra pass of drawing the quad and running the filter. Also, if you have some way of knowing ahead of time which areas do or don't or may or may not need anti-aliasing, you can use things like the viewport or the scissors test or even the stencil puffer to sort of single out areas and only execute the FXAA filter on areas that need anti-aliasing. So, yeah, there's a lot you can do. It starts out fast, and there's a lot you can do to make it even faster. So, if you need speed, this is a pretty good choice for performance. Another pro. This works on anything. Again, it's a filter. This works just as well on forward rendered images as it does on deferred render images, so you don't need to do anything weird or fancy to get it running on different rendering systems. You can even just take some image that you took and if it was a photograph and run this on if it for some reason that has aliasing or whatever. You know, it, it's, it's a filter, so it literally works on anything and everything that might need aliasing, whether it's forward, deferred, or something totally different. And it can also perform anti-aliasing in places that a lot of algorithms can't. Again, it doesn't care if things are geometric anti-alias, geometric aliasing, or specular aliasing, or whatever. The aliasing can come from anywhere, but if it detects it, it's still going to perform anti-aliasing on it. Which brings us to the cons. One of the big cons of this is it doesn't perform any form of temporal anti-aliasing. Not that most algorithms do this very well anyways, but here's the thing. Let's say you have some triangle that's moving way off in the distance, so and every frame it's moving less than a pixel. If I was anti-aliasing this with MSAA, for instance, then the pixels would slowly fade on as the triangle gets closer and closer to that pixel, and then slowly fade out as the triangle gets further and further away from another pixel. So it's a very smooth transition as it moves in the background. With FXAA, however, the pixels would still pop on and off as the triangle sort of covered them. The edges would still be smooth, but again, the pixels would still be very binary pop on, pop off as the triangle moves over the place. And that might not be what you're going for. Another another con is, since this is using an edge detection algorithm, they're not perfect. They can miss some edges that you might want anti-aliased. You can choose a very good one that gets just about every edge you'd ever care about, but it's still not perfect. It can still miss them, some things. On the other hand, it can erroneously detect edges if you get your edge detections too lenient, and that leads to the infamous texture blurring issue. So, yeah, it's a very careful balancing act of making sure you're detecting just the right edges, and you're applying appropriate blurring to them. And, yeah, so those are the pros and the cons of FXAA. So, that's just about all I wanted to cover in this video, so thank you. Hope you enjoyed, hope you learned, and in the next video, I'm going to show you how to do one implementation of FXAA. So, thank you, see you then.